Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today, like so many other days in Virtual Legality, we're talking Activision Blizzard, more specifically about the acquisition of Activision Blizzard by big tech titan Microsoft. If you aren't familiar with any part of this story, please do check out the playlist, Microsoft times Activision. It'll be 13 videos by the time this goes up. But all you really need to know for today's conversation is that Microsoft is purchasing Activision for a little under $70 billion. And because of the size, the technology bent to the company and more, it's likely that the Federal Trade Commission, who is rumored to be the agency of the U.S. government that's looking at this deal, will take a particularly close look at this deal. And because of that, on my social media, around the internet, and elsewhere, many questions have arisen about how that process works. We're going to be going over that again a little bit here, but more specifically, whether or not the Federal Trade Commission for, can ask for some zany stuff. And this originated from a video on Sifted, Sleep is for the Dead, I believe is what it stands for, by Michael Pachter. If you aren't familiar with Michael Pachter, he is an analyst of the video game industry. He advises potential investors and folks that are looking at the video game industry for what it is likely to look like in the future. You can check it out. I will link it in the description. But I don't envy Mr. Pachter his job. Actually trying to predict the future of any industry is difficult enough. The video game industry specifically so. So when a video comes out like this, which we'll talk about at length here in virtual legality, and it makes some pretty wild prognostications, people tend to look for somebody to ask about them. So as of February 24th, 2022, when these clips were shared with me, it appears that the Patreon-supported Pactor Factor episode, Season 7, Episode 7, Microsoft Activision Blizzard Acquisition Analysis went public. Right. As Sifted says on their Twitter, 20 minutes of analysis on Xbox buying Activision Blizzard free on our YouTube channel. You can check that out as well. I will link it in the description. But what came out of it was a number of people saying things like this. This is Tim Dog, noted Xbox fan. This is some take and he doubles down on it via Michael Pachter. Question to Hoglaw, is it possible for a deal like this where it actually affects other IPs from Obsidian and Bethesda? Now that Sounds interesting, but let's see what Michael Pachter actually had to say. So first things first, he says, my expectation is that Microsoft's going to receive a consent decree from the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. Now, consent decree is fancy legalese for a settlement. If you've been with us for a while, you know that we like to talk about how the FTC describes its role and the various laws that go into it. So a consent decree and a settlement is part of the potential end games for a review of a merger that the FTC or the DOJ will go through. And we've talked about this a lot in this playlist, but I think it's important to make sure we have the foundations understood for what this actually is. So this is a Hart Scott Rodino Act review that will be conducted as rumored by the Federal Trade Commission. They describe it as follows. After the companies report a proposed deal to us, they give a notification. The agencies, here the FTC, will do a preliminary review to determine whether it raises antitrust concerns that warrant closer examination. Because the FTC and the Department of Justice share jurisdiction over merger review, transactions requiring further review are assigned to one agency or the other. It's one of the reasons why we have a video in this playlist talking about the fact that the FTC reviewing it is not stepping outside of history or anything like that. During this preliminary review period, the parties must wait 30 days before closing their deal. It's not really an issue here. It's going to take a lot longer to get all the logistics dominoes in a row anyway. If, based on what the agency finds, it can terminate the waiting period and allow the parties to consummate their transaction. You send in your notification to the FTC. They say, oh, there's no antitrust problem here at all. We're not even going to make you wait 30 days. We can just do it now and we'll send you a note to that effect. You can let the waiting period expire, which allows the parties to consummate the transaction or... If the initial re review has raised potential competition issues, the agency may extend the review and ask the parties to turn over some more information. That that initial notification is enough. We need a second look at what's happening here. Understand that, as you can see, the United States doesn't approve these deals. It expires time. It allows them. The actual law here says, except as exempted pursuant to this law, 
No person shall acquire directly or indirectly any voting securities or assets of any other person. I know person sounds funny here, but that's legalese for individuals and entities. Unless both persons, or in the case of a tender offer, the acquiring person, file notification pursuant to the rules under these various subsections and the waiting period described in subsection B1 has expired. And you look at B1 and you get the waiting period required under subsection A shall begin on the date of the receipt by the FTC and the DOJ of the completed notification required. And if such notification is not properly completed, the notification of the extent completed and a statement of the reasons for such non-compliance and will end on the 30th day after the day of such receipt. You can see why I generally use website informational materials rather than the statues themselves. They aren't always written in a way that's terribly easy to go through. But suffice it to say, what's important here is that the time expires and there is no approval at the United States level. Now, you might also be asking, okay, the Federal Trade Commission can ask for more information. And then what happens? They get that more information and maybe they have a problem with it. The agency at that point, when the second window closes, may either close the investigation meaning that the second timer will have expired, the deal can go through, but not stopping the FTC from potentially suing in the future. Two, enter into a settlement with the companies. Or three, take a legal action in federal district court or through the FTC's administrative process to block the deal from going forward. So we need to understand the leverage here. The FTC's primary hammer that they can use on a merger nail is to stop the deal. They can block it with a lawsuit. And that's what they can threaten these companies with. But when you have the ability to threaten companies with basically anything, but obviously stopping something like a $70 billion deal, you can instead decide to not use the legal and administrative process. You can enter into a settlement. That's a consent decree. So what we're about to talk about here, the answer to the thumbnail question that I have posed is yes, the FTC can ask for certain things. Whether or not you feel like that's a mandate, an order, something along those lines is going to be in the eye of the beholder because it's going to take two to tango. We'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of the video. But here's what Michael Pachter says about what that consent decree might look like. He says he thinks that a consent decree from the FTC offered to Microsoft would have the following three requirements. No price increase to the Xbox for 10 years. He says the FTC would ask to lock in the price at which Xbox could actually be sold. No price increase to Game Pass for five years. And then the big one, the reason that people ask me about this, is, and any game in the Microsoft portfolio that has historically been published on PlayStation must be offered on PlayStation for future iterations. And he doubles down on this. He says, that's not just Activision. Nobody asked the question, what about the next Fallout? What about the next Elder Scrolls? My guess is Microsoft planned never to put those games on PlayStation. The government probably can require them to going forward. And that's where we start to get into these questions. Can they really do that? There's all sorts of stuff on Twitter and Reddit and various posts. Can they actually force Microsoft to sell games on PlayStation? How is that fair? And we can talk about the philosophies here in just a minute as well. But require is probably too strong because when we talk about a consent decree, we're talking about a settlement. Remember, all the FTC can really make happen is they can scuttle the deal. They can stop it. Now, they aren't the final arbiters of that. They can bring it up before the judiciary. We've talked about this in this playlist as well. The FTC is an executive branch agency. They can claim this restricts competition under the laws that were written by the legislative branch, and then they can bring a lawsuit to try to stop the deal uh, against Microsoft. And then the judiciary would have the final say as to whether or not the FTC has made its case. In fact, there's plenty of instances where the FTC or the DOJ has offered settlements that the acquirer has found wanting and says, all right, sue us. We don't think we're restricting competition at all. Sue us and we'll find out whether you have a good claim against us. FTC doesn't win every case. And so sometimes the acquirers go down that road. Lest you think that Michael Pachter isn't talking about what it sounds like he's talking about in a different clip that was also sent to me by Tim. New IP that's never been published before. And I'm not talking about Diablo 4. That's old IP. That's a sequel. You can put it as an exclusive all you want, but I would bet that the next Fallout, next Doom, next Quake, next Wolfenstein will be required by the FTC to be on PlayStation. So Michael Pachter goes out there with his analysis and everybody's entitled to their own opinion, lawyers, financial analysis, everyone else, and says this is what he thinks will happen as a part of the FTC review. Now, is that them actually requiring Microsoft to do these things? I would argue that it's not. 
right? What is happening here is Michael Pactor actually asserting that the FTC will find, for some reason that we can't fully understand just right now on the outside, that the Microsoft acquisition of Activision does run a risk of diminishing competition in a fashion that the FTC finds wanting. So once they kind of have that in their head, they then find themselves saying we can either sue them to block the deal or they're probably not going to want that to happen. We can start talking settlement and coming up with basically anything we want. Now, ostensibly, these things that they ask for have to be in the nature of not decreasing competition, increasing it in some fashion. So they would have to justify these, especially if Microsoft were to pout about them. But certainly the second point, I think, is one that I've raised in this playlist that does make some sense to me. If there is a competition issue here, and again, I think this deal is likely to pass without a substantive consent decree at about an 80 to 20 clip. There might be a consent decree that covers some non-material stuff, some little things, not at this level, uh, but I think it's 80, 20 likely to go through without major changes. Then if the FTC finds there to be a problem with this deal on that 20% side of the conversation, I think it is most likely to be with respect to Game Pass, that Game Pass is a unique product offering. It is a market of damn near one. And I know people like to put in PlayStation Plus and everything else into that bucket, but it is a very unique product offering. And I think it could be easily defined for legal terms as a market that Microsoft is seeking to dominate with this acquisition, making sure the Call of Duties of the world don't appear on competing subscription pass projects and that they can never appear on those things. And that if the FTC wants to make noise here because of the Biden administration executive order, because of what the FTC chairperson has said to Congress about more aggressively enforcing antitrust acts, game pass is where they're likely to do it. Now, I think these terms, even if the FTC were to put these things forth, are too long. In the world of technology, in the world of video games, 10 years is an eon. Five years is still very, very long. It's better part of a generation in terms of console lifespan. So if something like this were to happen, I don't see them trying to lock the Xbox price. I do potentially see them trying to act and say, hey, if you're trying to monopolize this, you're not going to have any purchase here. You can't increase the price of Game Pass for X amount of years. Now, if it gets short enough, Microsoft can look at their strategic plan internally and say, yeah, if it doesn't affect us, we can settle on anything, right? If somebody sets up guardrails and you weren't ever planning to get out of your lane, the guardrails don't matter. And sometimes you see consent decrees that look like that, where aspects of the federal government, whether it's the EEOC in the case of Activision, the FTC here, set up settlements and consent decrees and the party's pretty much okay with it. So they don't feel like they gave anything up, even if it looks like they might have. This third point, I think, is extraordinarily unlikely to happen, but it could happen. The other aspect of this is not just the mandate part, which I don't think is actually happening because it takes two to tango and you need to agree on a settlement, a consent decree on both sides for it to even happen. But this last part, I don't think Microsoft would ever accede to. I think they would be much more likely to say, well, then sue us because we don't even think you have a good case for claiming that we are restraining trade. So when we start talking about this, when we start looking at, hey, could they force Fallout? Could they force the Elder Scrolls? Could they force these games onto PlayStation? I still believe that both on the Sony side and the Microsoft side, everything that is multiplayer and historically multi-platform is very likely to remain such because that's where it finds the money that it's making. That's Call of Duty. That's Destiny 2. You have a big multiplayer element. You have that zeitgeist created by the network effects and the size of your audience across platforms. Those still make sense to go across the border, if you will. But for single player games like Elder Scrolls, like Fallout, I think that there is a much more reasoned position that Microsoft has basically evinced through its treatment of Starfield that they don't want those things to necessarily go to PlayStation. Could that change? Yes. Could the FTC ask them to do that? Yes. If you're talking about defending a $70 billion deal and Microsoft says, well, we'll still be making 70%. It's not the way we'd like to run our business but we can agree to this for an X amount of years because we want to get Activision under our umbrella, then you start to evaluate things as what is being offered by the FTC. So part of this conversation is, do you think Microsoft would agree to these things? Because as I said, we have evidence of what this settlement process looks like a little bit from the very recent past. I keep bringing this particular deal up because it's very unique in the technology space. NVIDIA was set to acquire ARM for $40 billion, and it didn't happen. In fact, the FTC crows about that, right? On February 14th, 2022, Valentine's Day, the day of merger killing love, they say 
The termination of what would have been the largest semiconductor chip merger will preserve competition for key technologies and safeguard future innovation. This result is particularly significant because it represents the first abandonment of a litigated vertical merger in many years. It's the FTC's first win of the decade or something along those lines, at least in this space. So the FTC sues because they say, hey, when you buy that, that's going to really hurt competition. NVIDIA, of course, disagrees. They want to get their $40 billion done. And you can see in their defense documents exactly what the settlement slash consent decree negotiations look like. They go on and on and on. We're not interested in the details of this so much, but we can get to the place where the consent decree process looks. It says, regardless, to put the FTC's wholly speculative concerns to rest, respondents have offered a comprehensive remedy, including structural commitments that would ensure all ARM licensees have unbiased, non-discriminatory access to ARM's IP, product plans, roadmaps, and innovations. This remedy should address any doubts about the transaction and indeed will ensure a more fair and level playing field for ARM licensees than ARM provides today. We don't get a ton of details here, and I'm not going to go over their 49 pages of documents on a case we're not following. But suffice it to say, this was ARM and the FTC talking about what a settlement might look like. And in that settlement process, either side can basically offer or ask for anything they want. The FTC can go and say, we're going to stop this deal. We're going to sue you. You're going to become NVIDIA unless we come to some kind of arrangement and you better make it worth our while because it takes both of us to sign that consent decree document. They looked at ARM, they looked at NVIDIA, and they said, whatever NVIDIA is offering here with respect to a comprehensive remedy, they found to be wanting. But that will be happening behind the scenes if the FTC arrives at the place where they say, hey, if you don't settle with us, we're going to sue you. And if Microsoft thinks that their argument is bad, if it's weak, then Microsoft says, fine, sue us. Let's go to court. Let's do this. If they think there's any chance that they could lose there, and there's always really a chance that you can lose in litigation, then they might say, all right, well, what do you need from us? What does that look like? And they might agree to certain aspects of this, something that looks like this. Again, I think Game Pass and its price is the most likely of these various things. Do I think there's any chance that something like this actually happens? No. But can the FTC ask for it? A hundred thousand percent, they can ask for it. But it won't happen unless Microsoft agrees. And if Microsoft doesn't agree, maybe the Activision deal on the whole is put at risk because the FTC decides to sue NVIDIA and ARM style. But Microsoft's only problem there is if the deal gets blocked on the whole. You're not going to get this kind of injunctive equitable relief position at the court level, mostly. Of course, people can still settle after litigation has started. That's the beauty of the settlement process. So in short, when folks ask me these questions, when they come out and say, question, is it possible? Yes. The other aspect of this I wanted to touch on before I let you go is that folks said, hey, the Bethesda deal went through. They can't come back for the Bethesda Zenimax stuff. They can't come back for Obsidian or Ninja Theory or any of this stuff. The answer to that is yes, they can, not because of anything in the law, but because the settlement can always be whatever's in your power. There was no deal to acquire Game Pass, and yet the FTC can, in fact, ask for that Game Pass price to be locked. Now, that might be unwise. I am a corporate lawyer. I tend to think that too much meddling, picking winners and losers, getting into the business model specifics at the FTC or the DOJ level is unwise. Not in every instance, not with every request, but very often government regulators aren't going to know any better than Microsoft or Activision or anyone else what should be happening in these industries and business models. So I understand when folks come in here, especially Xbox fans, it's they couldn't actually ask for this, could they, Rick? The answer is yes, they could ask for it. And if Microsoft were okay with it, Microsoft could agree to it. But if Microsoft isn't, then the FTC's hammer is threatening the deal. So I just wanted to get that out there because I think both Michael Pactor and some of the folks that are talking about this on the Sony or the Xbox sides uh, don't necessarily explain everything that's happening here. I think require is a little strong. The implied end of this sentence is the government can require them if they want the Activision to be owned by them, right? It's if they want Activision, then the government can ask for a certain amount of things. Require, they can't actually force somebody. They can't go to court and say, yes, you have to put these games on PlayStation, but they can go to court and say, then you, you can't have the deal. It restricts competition too much. Here's our case. And you see what a judge has to say about it. So I wanted to be a little bit more clear there. 
If you enjoy this conversation about the business and law of video games, technology, pop culture, and more, please consider supporting the channel. We're doing these kinds of conversations all the time. We've got a Patreon. We've got tiers. You can check it out down below. Otherwise, just subscribing, telling your friends, upvoting, downvoting, sharing this information with people that you see talking about it, whether it's Tim at Xbox, whether it's other people on Twitter or Reddit or YouTube or Facebook or wherever else you find them. Hopefully, the purpose of this channel is to get more and better information out there. The FTC can ask, but they can't do anything unless Microsoft agrees to it, all the while threatening to potentially scuttle the deal if Microsoft doesn't come to the negotiating table. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.